So my parents have no idea what I do. If their friends ask them, what does your daughter do? They each have very different ways of answering that question. My mother, if you ask her, will probably say, I don't know, she does a bunch of different things. Just go look at her website. My dad, who is very precise and analytical, just like me, he will launch into a very long, very tedious history of my life. He will basically rattle off my entire resume for anybody who's still standing. And for parents who, by the way, have invested handsomely in their daughter's education, and who've spent the better part of the last 10 years not quite knowing what she's doing with her life, they're very nice about it. They're very supportive, probably more than I deserve. But the reason that question is so difficult for them to answer is because I do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And I've been doing quite a lot of this these days. And I do a little bit of this and I've also been dabbling in some things like this off late. So when your body of work is such a mixed bag, labels obviously get a little tricky. I call myself an artist, designer, and writer. But if I'm being honest, I really don't care for any of those labels. Because there's only one reason I did all of those things, and it's a really simple one. Because I felt like it because they made me happy. And so I decided to make it my mission, somewhat foolishly, to figure out how could I go through my entire life without ever having to choose? How could I get away with never having to choose? And I can't say that I figured it out, but I do believe I'm on a path that's headed somewhere good if my being here is any indication. And so I want to share with you some of the things I've learned along the way that have made that question just a little bit less impossible and just a little bit less of a fantasy. I use the word fantasy because it's kind of like a child's perspective on life, right? You wake up every morning and you think to yourself, what do I feel like doing today? And then you dive into whatever strikes your fancy. You're a farmer one day, an archaeologist the next, a scientist the next because we all start off creative. We all start off creative. We build pillow forts in our bedrooms. We steer fake pirate ships. We all start off creative. But eventually, life gets in the way, right? Life comes in and tells us, you have to pick something. And then you have to get really, really good at it. So good that people will pay you money for it. And then you can use that money to put a roof over your head and clothes on your back. And life's not wrong, by the way. I mean, life can be bleak, but life's not wrong about any of that. And so by the time we've hardened into our adult selves, we're all left feeling just a little bit violated and manhandled by life. So I began unconsciously designing my whole existence around one question. How could I keep life from putting its grubby little paws all over my inner child? How could I grow up without really growing up? And I was terrified of growing up, by the way. Terrified. I was terrified of turning into this cynical adult who spends all their time complaining about horrible bosses and the rising price of tomatoes. <laughs> when I was 21, I knew that adulthood was approaching fast, and I wouldn't be able to hold it off for much longer. Because trying to hold on to your inner child is actually not child's play at all. It's a very adult game of strategy. So I decided to write this graphic memoir, and I called it The Breadcrumb because I thought to myself, if I one day turn into this dull, boring adult, I need to leave a trail so that I can find my way back to myself. And so I found that I would do this often. I would try to preserve bits and pieces of myself in my work. It's like there was this power in creative work, as if it could make you immortal, as if you could live on through the objects you create. I recognized my love for making things very early on. 
When my brother and I were kids, we would play games of make-believe, and I used to really enjoy making the objects that would bring those imaginary worlds to life. We couldn't cast magic spells without a real spell book. We couldn't pretend to be secret agents without little ID badges. Even in school, people caught on quickly to the fact that I could make things. I used to know how to use Photoshop in school. Highly coveted skill as a high schooler. <laughs> <laughs> because I used to get a lot of custom photoshopping requests. Most often, it was photoshopping someone's head onto their favorite footballer's body. <laughs> and I'm not going to put any of that up because it's very embarrassing, <laughs> and it will ruin my street cred as a graphic designer. <laughs> But my ability to make things made people look at me differently. Their eyes would light up in wonder, as if I had performed some kind of magic, as if I was some kind of wizard. And I began to really crave that feeling. So naturally, I went to art school. I remember in my first year of art school, I made this book, Grandma Wars, which was a fake history textbook about my relationship with my grandmother. And so I continued playing these whimsical games of make believe. And art school did nothing to stop me. Art school continued to let me believe that I could do anything. I could make books and I could make graphic novels. I could make miniatures. I could do writing and academic research and graphic design. And I was in utopia. But when the time came to figure out how to turn that into my profession, I had a very real question to answer. How could I do all of these things and still be taken seriously at all of them? Because being a jack of all trades and a master of none is a real thing. I didn't want to do any of these things as a hobby. I wanted to be a real artist and a real designer and a real miniaturist and a real writer. And I realized the first person who had to start taking those things seriously was actually myself. Because unfortunately, people have fallen into the trap of believing that the things that make them happy are not the things that can make them a living. The world teaches us to believe that the things that bring us joy have to be put off until the weekend. And I hated that idea. I thought it was completely upside down. I wanted to use my five days of the week to do things that were fun, so that I could use my weekend to sleep and watch a whole lot of Judge Judy. <laughs> In 2017, I started the Dollhouse Project, which is a miniature parallel universe in which a tiny version of myself lives her own life. She has a house of her own. Her house was designed by real interior designers. It took me eight months to construct it. It was featured on Architectural Digest, which was a huge win for both me and her. <laughs> We had a dollhouse warming party. People brought her gifts and flowers. It's a whole thing. She's currently back in India right now because she refused to leave her home and come to Providence with me. And uh, that's that's what her house looks like. So you can kind of see why she refused to leave. I started this project when I was at my last job. And sure, in the beginning, I used to work on it over the weekends. And everyone thought it was some cute, weird little hobby. <laughs> But it wasn't a hobby for me. I had a vision for it. I invested time and money into it. Because I treat every project as if it's something that I am one day going to be known for. As if it's something that will one day be on a Wikipedia page about me. And so it's up to you to start taking seriously the playful things that you do. Now, does that mean I will never again take a job or work for someone else? No, I might very well have to do that. But I don't necessarily see that as a setback to the larger life plan. The way I see it, jobs are kind of like financial rest stops. They let you conserve your creative energy, recharge your batteries, and save up for what comes next. My last job allowed me to save up to make the dollhouse project happen, and that then brought in a whole new wave of work that was much closer to what I wanted to do with my life. So I was always very careful not to let my professional identity and my name become too attached to a job or an organization. I didn't like the idea of my value being whittled down to a couple of meaningless lines on my resume. 
And I thought about how sad it was that that's how most of the professional world operates. And that's actually what's so special about the creative industry, because it is the one place where you get to be judged entirely based on what you make. Not your job titles, not your salaries, not your promotions, but what you make. So whatever else I did, I always made the time to create work that was just mine, work that I could put my name on. Even so, I had a difficult time in my mid-twenties because I was desperately holding on to my young, idealistic self while also figuring out how to do this thing called adulting. You see, I had this really clear vision in my head of all these things I wanted to do. I wanted to write books. I wanted to start the Dollhouse Project. I wanted to mentor students. I wanted to start a magazine. And I wanted to do all of these things in a big way right away. And if that wasn't enough, I also wanted to do it all by the time I was 25, because I was under the impression it was all going to be downhill after that. And you know what? I got nothing done. Nothing. I basically paralyzed myself. Every morning, I would wake up with 10 new amazing ideas. My to-do list would just keep getting longer and longer, and I would stare at it and have no idea where to start. And so it wasn't until my 26th birthday rolled around that I thought to myself, well, screw it. I'm already old now. <laughs> Let's just give up and do this one at a time. And that's when things started to pick up again. And as much as I hate the word networking, right? We all hate it, right? I've realized it is the lifeblood of the interdisciplinary practitioner. You see, discipline is kind of like a parent. You may not always like its rules, but as long as you follow them, you'll have a roof over your head. If you're an expert in your field, someone or the other will pay you for your work. But if you decide not to commit to a discipline, then you're going to need allies. The only thing that has sustained my interdisciplinary practice in the last few years is because I've been embraced by the people who work within those disciplines. People who've referred me to new clients, artists who are willing to collaborate with me, and the only reason they welcome me whenever I visit is because I try my damnedest to treat their discipline with respect. Because disciplines are not a joke. They each have a long history of practice. And when you move from discipline to discipline, you start learning how to speak all their languages. How do they move? Who's their audience? How do they make money? And when you become that fluid, that's when something really magical starts to happen because you start seeing opportunities in a completely different way from other people. Where other people see disciplines as closed and suffocating shapes, you start seeing them as permeable. I remember last year, when I was preparing to come to RISD for a research program, one of my very dear mentors said to me, this is great, and you're going to have a fantastic time, but don't lose sight of your artistic practice, because nobody reads academic papers. And I thought to myself, well, sure, that's true. But who says I have to write a normal paper? And so I wrote this. I called it a graphic essay. And mind you, this isn't perfect. It has a lot of kinks to be ironed out. But the point is, you start getting really comfortable with experimentation. And experimentation is like a muscle. A muscle that has atrophied for most people who are married to their discipline and have gotten used to doing things the same way over and over again. A month ago, I decided to push my experimentation further, and I took this little piece that I had written and turned it into an interactive essay. And so I made this box. When you learn how to think across disciplines, you then gain the unique power to be able to borrow from all of them and then create something that takes people by surprise, keeps them guessing, shows them a little bit of wonder and a little bit of wizardry. And when you put people in that state, they're a lot more open to hearing what you have to say. So the next time your inner child sees something cool or fun or interesting, and you think to yourself, damn, I wish I could do something like that. 
do it. Start. Start anywhere, whether it's painting something, drawing something, writing something, making something out of Play-Doh. Do it. Do it messily, do it sloppily, do it the way a child would do it. And then let your adult self strategize and figure out how to turn it into something more. But that comes second, not first. What comes first must always be play and wonder and whimsy. Because the more you give in to that whimsy, the more you begin to slowly unravel and untangle yourself from the web that's called your discipline. So for my parents, who are back home in India watching this right now, I hope, <laughs> I've taken the liberty of coming up with a few labels that they can use for me. They could call me a multimodal communicator. But then I realized that kind of sounds like an internet router. <laughs> they could instead call me an architect of alternate realities. But then I started to think that sounds like a character from a Marvel movie. <laughs> and I really hate Marvel movies. <laughs> they could instead call me a transdisciplinary storyteller. Eh. And if none of those work, and I don't think any of them do, then at the very, very least, I now have this talk that I can link them to, that they can share with their friends and family. Thank you. <laughs>